Hello, my name is Patrick Allen, and I am an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And this is uh, conducted under the auspices of the Hamilton Cincinnati uh, County, Cincinnati Hamilton County Library in Cincinnati, Ohio. And the uh, gentleman there is uh, Brian Powers. We have a cameraman today is uh, Jim O'Donnell. He's also a, uh, a Navy veteran. And we have the privilege today of uh, interviewing Paul Scott James. Paul, thank you, thank you for doing this interview. You're welcome. And uh, <clears throat> today is May the 17th, and we're at the Champaign Aviation Museum, which is at the Grimes Municipal Airport, just north of Urbana, Ohio. And uh, <clears throat> Paul, let's let's start with uh, when and where you were born. I was born in on a farm in Vaden, Mississippi, 1945, February 16th. And where is Vaden in respect to any larger town that someone would be familiar it's, with? It's 65 miles north of the capital of uh, Mississippi, Jackson. Jackson, all mm -hmm. right. And what were your mom and dad's names? My father's name was Ralph James. My mother's name was Maddie Kane. You know when uh, your mom and dad uh, got married? No, I don't. I think it was 1944, I believe. You remember where they got married? They got married in Baden. Okay. What did your dad do? What kind of work? He was a truck driver. Uh huh. And my mother was a farmer. She grew up on a farm. Uh, what was your mother's maiden name? Kane. How do you spell that? C A I N. Okay. There's no E on the end of that. Just no, no E on the end of that? C-A-I-N, uh -huh. just Kane. And <clears throat> what kind of truck did your dad drive? Was he a semi-truck driver? Yes, he was uh, a semi-truck driver. Just local or over the road? He, d he drove for a, a, a grocery company, which later became Piggly Wiggly, which is known oh, yeah. that's, that's all over the South. All over the South, right, right. Um, so... Uh, you were born there in Vaden. How long did you live in Vaden? I lived in Vaden until I finished college. Good. How about brothers and sisters? Did you have any sisters? I had, I had one sister, Vivian. She, uh, John, she was an airline stewardess for a while, a flight attendant, as they call them now. And then she, joined, she spent 10 years in the military. She attained the rank of sergeant, and she retired. And she passed away three years ago. I'm sorry to hear that. So, uh, was she an airline pilot before she went to the military, or did she go to the military first? She, I'm she went into the military. She went in the military after. What airlines did she fly with? I want to say Delta, but I'm not positive. I think Delta. And then she, um, she. she uh, Volunteered for the service? Yes, yes, she volunteered for the service. What what branch was she in? She was in uh, Army Intelligence. Where was she stationed for most of her she spent She was in Germany. Then she went to uh, doing Operation Desert Storm. She was in Desert Storm. And when she came back from Desert Storm, I think it had an impact on her because after that she shortly retired. All right. So what she do over in Desert Storm? Did you talk to her about that? No, I did not. She she never really talked about it. Do you know how long she was over there in the Middle East? She was in Germany for about six years. She was in Desert Storm. She was there for for the uh, duration. All right. And when she came back, uh, where did she come back to? What town? She came back to Cleveland, Ohio, well, and then she moved to. Uh, she worked for a defense contractor in uh, Birmingham, Alabama for a while, and then she, she retired. Was she Vivian worked for Boeing. She worked for Boeing. Boeing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was uh, Vivian married? Yes. What was her married name? Uh, Simpson. Simpson? Uh, do you, 
is her husband still living? Yes, he's still living. He uh, he was also in the uh, military. He, I believe he was in artillery, but he was in the military. I think she met him when she was stationed in Germany. Uh, do you know if he got over into Desert Storm? Yes, he also went to Desert Storm. Uh, uh, but he made it through that okay? Yes, he made it through okay. And he went back to Cleveland? Uh, yes, they went back to <coughs> Cleveland. Then I said, then they moved to Boeing. And, they moved to Birmingham, Alabama, where she worked for Boeing, and I think he drove a truck. She still lived down there in Alabama? No, he moved to uh, Mississippi. He moved into my mother, well, they moved into my mother's house when she passed away, and my sister passed away living there in Vaden, and Clifford continues to live there. Her husband continues to live there. So uh, when did your mom pass away? She passed away three years ago. Sorry to hear that. How about your father? Is he still living? N no, no, he passed away in in the early 80s. Oh. How about uh, children? Do you have children? I have I have three girls. The oldest is Paula. She's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She's what's, her what's her last name? James. James. So she never married. No, she never married. She's a massage therapist in. Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've got her birth date as uh, November 24th of 1970? Yes. All right. And my other, my second oldest daughter, Nicole, they live in uh, New Orleans and she is a full colonel in the, in the Army. She is, I think, approaching retirement. When I talked to her this morning, she was thinking about getting out. She volunteered? Yes, yeah, she volunteered. She went through uh, ROTC. She attended Hampton University under the ROTC program, and she went up through the ranks to the rank of full colonel. Was she married? Yes, she's married. Her husband, Derek Spears, is a retired lieutenant colonel. Oh, you've got some nice uh, military background in yes. the family. Yes, yes. And uh, how do you spell Spears? Is S P E A or E I R S? Spears. Spears. S P E A R S. Spears. E -A -R. Huh. Okay. And I've got her born uh, October 21 of 72. Yes. And your third uh, sister. My third daughter, Shannon. Third daughter. Shannon Celestine. She lives in Slidell, Louisiana. She's a senior vice president for Santander Finance Corporation. Nice. And she she married? Uh, no, she's not married. And I've got her birth date as uh, August the 19th of 1980. Yes. Uh, Vivian, uh, I forget, did she have children? No, she did not. Right. Nicole has one child, uh, Dominique. She's 12 years old. Shannon does not have any children. Uh, all right. Now, <clears throat> where did you go to grade school? I went to grade school at Vaden. I hate to say it, but the name at that time was Vaden Negro High. Uh, segregated school? Segregated school, right. yes, sir. Uh, I'm kind of familiar with that because I went, played basketball here in the north and played some games down the south, and I'm aware of the segregation. Yes. How about high school? Uh, Vaden Negro High School. And after graduating from high school, uh, I entertained the idea of volunteering for the Air Force. And my uncle, who was a Korean War veteran, told me, he said, uh, if you will give college a shot, he said, I will pay for your first year. He said, I don't want you to go into the military. So I went in. I attended Mississippi Valley State where I received a, a bachelor's degree in industrial arts. After graduation... When did you, when did you get that degree? Hmm? What year did you get that degree? 67, because matter of fact, I was in Vietnam when my class graduated. <laughs> All right. So you didn't get to get your diploma. <laughs> well, I, I I graduated early because I went to summer school and I took a lot of hours. Because what I would do is I would take classes during the week and I'd go home on the weekends and help my uncle on the farm. So, uh, and doing, as a student, I also worked on some of the faculty members' cars that helped pay my tuition because I didn't, I didn't have a lot of money. Well, how did so, you learn to do, work on cars? 
I worked on faculty members' cars on sometimes and in the evenings after. How'd you learn that? Huh? How'd, you, how'd you learn to do that? Or were you just cleaning them up, or were you doing mechanical well, work? Well, by growing up on a farm and being poor, we only bought one new tractor. The rest of the stuff was used, and we'd have to <laughs> repair it to get it to go. And I remember we bought an F600 Ford truck from a guy, and it took us all day to get it started. We finally got it running and drove it home. We quit. Luckily, we lived at the bottom of a hill. Luckily, it, when it decided to quit, we were at the top of the hill, and we rolled down the hill into the farm yard. And from there, we took it apart and repaired it. And uh, that was our grain truck. Now, when you say we, you and your uncle? My uncle. My, so my uncle taught me a lot about automobiles. What was your uncle's name? James Kane. Uh, he, was, was, he was my mother's brother. I was going to ask, yeah. OK. So uh, that's, that's how you got your introduction to uh, automotive repairs. Yes, yes. And, and since, since I have, I, uh, after the service, I got an early out when I came back from the when I came back from Vietnam. I, went, I was stationed in Fort Carson, Colorado, and I discovered that you could get out early. And what triggered that was we were sent to the '68 National Convention in Chicago to provide security if needed because of the riots that were going on there. And I decided I had had enough. So I discovered that if I were to teach school, I could get out early. So I got out three months early to, to teach school in Springfield, Ohio. So well, I good. taught. But, but you didn't have a teaching certificate. Yes, I did. did. I well, graduated. Did and I, well, I knew you graduated. And I had a teaching certificate because I also did the, the uh, student teaching. I did okay. the whole nine yards. Okay. I didn't understand that you uh, yeah. graduated with a BS in education. Yes, I did. I thought it was just industrial arts. It was, it was industrial arts, but it was for educational purposes. Good. Uh, so uh, we've got you uh, joining this military. Were you, were you uh, drafted or did you? I was, I was drafted. I was teaching school in Columbus, Ohio. What school were you teaching? I was teaching at TECO. It was a uh, industrial... Uh, trade school for for delinquents. It was out on East on West Broad Street. Okay. I don't think it's in existence anymore. But uh, that's where I taught school and I was drafted from, from there by the Mississippi Draft Board because they didn't give an exemption for the particular field I was teaching. Okay. So I got drafted, I went to a Fort Knox for my basic training. I where, did where did you report oh, at Fort first, Hayes. I Fort reported Hayes Fort Columbus. Hayes in Columbus. From there, I was shipped to uh, Fort Knox. I did my basic training in Fort Knox. How did you get there? Bus. <laughs> All night. Because <laughs> I, re I remember they told us when we got there, I said, well, since you guys got here late, we're going to let you sleep in. Well, they let us sleep in until 4 o'clock the next morning. <laughs> and they got us up. And after basic training, I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana. How long was your basic there in Fort Knox? Uh, eight weeks, I believe. So what'd you learn there in basic? Just the, ba the basic little fundamentals of... Uh, well, somebody that might be watching this 30 years from now might not understand what you're doing in basic. Okay, basic training, you, you learn the basic use of firearms, you learn drill, and the main thing was you learn to work as a team, to follow orders. And uh, of course, you you have to qualify on the rifle range. You have to pass certain certain physical tests, and to just get the basics of of being in the in the military was basically what it was about. And after that, we were flown to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana, and that way we got the dedicated training on how to operate in the jungle, how to maneuver at night and different aspects of combat in a jungle situation. And I suppose Fort Polk, Louisiana was the closest they could come to a, a jungle setting. So did they, had they set up a special area? Yes, it simulate? was called Jungle Land. Okay. It's called Jungle Land in Fort Polk, and that's where we... Where was Fort Polk located in Louisiana? <laughs> 
I, w I want to say it would be west of Baton Rouge. I'm not really okay. positive. How long were you at Fort Polk? We were there for nine weeks. After the nine weeks of uh, jungle training, we, uh, we were given a 30-day leave. Then I reported to uh, Oakland uh, base in, uh, San, in uh, California. Well, let's, let's stay at Fort Polk for a, for a little bit. What would your average day be at uh, well, Fort Polk? We would go out and... What time would you get up? I'd say five o'clock in the morning. That would take me for your full. Okay, day. five. You say say get you at five o'clock in the morning, and uh, <coughs> you'd have breakfast, usually PT, and they load us on trucks. They call them cattle trucks. They take us out to the field, where we participated in, in M60, 50 caliber, and then later on I was assigned to 81 millimeter mortars, and four deuce mortars. So in the end I was a I was a mortar crewman. And uh that's basically what we did every day. We did uh I believe a five mile uh avoidance course where you would uh they would take you out and turn you loose and give you a compass and you had to go to the uh the other side of the uh safe area and there were intruders that trying to uh, capture you to uh simulate if you were caught behind the lines and how you had to evade and escape to get back to the safety of, of your lines. How did you personally do in that training? Were I, you? Did, I did fine. Oh. I, I uh, qualified uh, expert in the 45 and the, and the M16. Okay. Um, what, what did you do to become uh, qualified for your, your mortar? Uh, well, group? they, they trained us uh, the 81 and four point deuce mortar and the 60 millimeter mortar, they are indirect fire weapons. So we were trained to plot the uh, targets on a map. We used a thing called a, a, a uh, aiming circle where you semi-imposed a map on this aiming circle. You, you would position, you would have the position of your gun and then you'd have map coordinates and directions and according to what the forward observer information would give you then you would plot your direct fire. And will you use some live ammunition? Uh, yes we did. We used live ammunition. What would be the range of the mortars that you were? The you four deuce was the... five miles. The uh, 81 was maybe a mile. I'm, I'm, that's, my memory escapes me but uh, Okay, you finished at Fort Polk, and then where did you go? We went to Oakland, California to be processed to Vietnam. When I got to Vietnam, we went to Benoit. How did you get there? We flew over on a C-141. And by the way, that was backwards all the way. We were sitting facing towards the rear of the plane. Some guys had, had birthdays on the plane, and we had no idea when because you cross the international date line. So we had no idea. So we landed and well, the how, did it, how did it feel? Uh, I, I hate to interrupt you. No, no. But uh, how, how did it feel uh, flying backwards on the airplane? <laughs> kind of weird because I, I remember they let us come up and look, come up to the cockpit and look out and all I could see was darkness. So I said, well, I hope this guy knows where he's going. <laughs> but I suppose for for safety reasons, that's why the military had to sit backwards because I, mean, I don't know how many people was on this cargo plane, but it was nothing but seats. I, I was going to ask you how many fellows were with you. I don't, I don't, I don't know how many was on the plane. What I guess. equipment did you have with you? Nothing. Nothing but our uniforms and our duffel bag but you, with the basic, uh, you, you know, clothing issue. When did you first realize you were going to be sent to Vietnam? I realized I was going to be sent to Vietnam when I was drafted. Okay. <laughs> um, so you you had some time, uh, you had you had some leave before Thirty you days. actually were sent over to Vietnam. Yes. And how, how did you get home? Uh, we uh, I flew Trans Texas Airlines to uh, out of out of Baton Rouge to Jackson, Mississippi, and I caught the bus, Greyhound bus 
from uh, Jackson, Mississippi to my hometown. Uh, and how long were you there? How long was at home? At home, yeah. On I was I was there for about I don't know twenty eight days or something like that. Then I had to I had my uncle took me to the airport and in Jackson and I flew to uh, Oakland. Did you have a girlfriend at home? Yeah, I had one, but you know, back in those days when you're that age, it, it wasn't anything serious. You okay. know, it was just kind of a casual relationship. Did you play any sports in school? Uh, I played baseball for a while, but uh, I Farm my plate was probably kept you busy, didn't it? Yeah, my my plate was just too full, just trying to uh, survive college and get through because, like I said, I was going home on the weekend to farm and uh, uh, didn't really have a lot of time for extracurricular activities. How big a farm did your uncle have? He had a we had we had a 200 acre farm. And what, what Back then, raise? that was a kind of a large farm. Of course, now it's nothing. And we raised livestock, had cotton, soybeans, and corn. And during the winter, he would cut logs. He was also a logger. We would cut logs during the winter okay. to to make extra money. Uh, did did you have a a little sawmill, or would you haul the logs to no, the sawmill? No, we haul the logs to a sawmill. Okay, uh, so uh, you're leaving California and you're flying in a, what'd you say, a C what? C-141. All right, and that was strictly military? Yes, yeah, strictly military. Some fellows uh, tell me they flew over commercial, but you... No, no, we flew over strictly military all the way. Where did you land? We we went to a Benoit. All right, let me... Got a map. Uh, now let's see if our cameraman can you see that, Jim? Yeah. Benoit is right here. This is where we flew. We flew into Benoit, and there we were distributed to different units. And like I said, I was sent to the third, twenty-second, or twenty-fifth. This was Tainan. And then we ended up in a fire base called Dao Tang, a little small village. And that's where I spent the majority of my time in this, this operational area here, Tainan and Coochie in this area here. And uh, we, we did patrols. A lot of it was transportation by helicopter. So what unit were you in? 3rd, 22nd, 25th Infantry Division. And what was your rank when you got there? I was a PFC when I got to Vietnam. I made a E2 out of uh, basic training, and I made PFC out of jungle training. They always promoted, uh, I don't know if it was exceptional soldiers or they just had to promote someone. But anyway, I made E3 or PFC out of jungle training. Then I went to Vietnam and after about three months I was an E4. And uh, as attrition and guys rotating out, I was, I was promoted to a E5 a sergeant or, or squad leader. Well, let's, uh, let's get into a little more detail about when you got there. You landed at Dao Tang? Yes, I landed at Dao Tang. And how long did you stay there? Mm, you I'm, just, I'm sorry, we landed at, at uh, Benoit. Benoit. Uh, we were there for about three or four days because they were, they were sending out, you know, replacements. And uh, that's when I was selected to go to uh, Dao Tang, 3rd, 22nd, 25th Infantry Division. And I was assigned to uh, Company B, 4th uh, Platoon, which was the weapons platoon. So we, we uh, carried 81 millimeter mortars. We would, we would act as a regular soldier during the day and they'd bring out the 81s if they would need it at night, and we manned 81 millimeter mortars at night. How many men were in the platoon? I believe about 30. And how about company? How many men were in the company? It, it fluctuated. At times there were maybe 120, 150, and sometimes there were 
There were, you know, after a battle or whatever, sometimes there wasn't very many. In your, in your, in your platoon that you were first as assigned to, um, how many other uh, African Americans were in that platoon with you? So would he have been for the torch? At any given time, there was usually about four or five. Did you experience any of the segregation problems like you had experienced at home when you were a kid? No, not really. I remember this Italian kid, Gennetti. We were talking one day and he said, uh, you know, uh, I just want you to understand and make it clear that I don't like being called a WAP. <laughs> so I looked at him, I said, what's a WAP? He said, that's a slang name for Italians. I said, really? I said, I'd never heard of that before. So he said, well, don't call me a WAP. I said, hey, I'm good. But no, n n I never really saw any outright racism. I saw it at home, I saw it when I got back. But over there, no, I can say I did not. Everybody's looking out for everybody else. Well, there were, there were two battles fought. That was one battle that we were fighting for the United States. But the primary battle, we were fighting for one another. <coughs> and I think anybody will tell you that that's what, that's how we survive and that's how you win. You take, if you take care of your buddy, then everything else will fall in place. Mm -hmm. So uh, you were there for three or four days and then you got sent where? I got sent up to uh, Dao Tang to assign to my company. And uh, I remember the first operation we went on, they took us up to the airstrip and set us up in pairs of six. And oh my God, here comes all these helicopters coming down the airstrip and they settled down and they motioned for us to jump on the helicopter. So I remember sitting on the seat, it was four guys on the seat, two on the floor facing toward the rear. And I was never so scared in my life. And First time on a helicopter? First time on a helicopter. And there was this kid named Torch. I asked Torch, I said, hey, I said, what keeps you from falling out? He said, he said, the wind will hold you in. So scared and I didn't know. I said, okay. I found out later that that wasn't true. But anyhow, <laughs> They dropped us off in this jungle, and I, God, I was scared to death. And we were moving through the jungle, and all of a sudden, some shots, machine gun fire, or automatic weapon fire, and we all hit the ground, and I'm laying down with my head almost covered up. And when it was all over, my squad leader came over, and he said, Paul said, I saw what you did. He said, you can't do that, so you gotta hold your head up, he said, and look around and be observant. He said, because if you don't, you're not going to make it out of here. So I said, okay. And then the platoon sergeant come over and he said, one of the guys, I think the second platoon, Baxter Ellis, was just killed and said, we want you and two other guys to come over and help us load him on the chopper. I said, give these, so his friends won't have to do it. So we went over. And I remember his shoulder was almost shot off. And we helped the medic put him in a poncho and we loaded him on a chopper. And after that, I guess reality set in and I realized that I'm not going anywhere. And you know, you gotta learn to survive. And I thought that sergeant was being awful cruel coming over asking a new guy to do this but I don't know if he knew it or not, but that, that kind of strengthened me and I understood what I was up against. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I think it helped me survive. But at, I just thought it was awful cruel for him to ask me to do that and I had just hit country a week ago. But anyhow, and 
As for the helicopter and the wind, about a month later, I was going out. They were taking me out to the field because I, I had shoulder burns on my shoulder, so they kept me off the line for a couple of days till they heal. And I'm sitting on the seat, and there's a bunch of sea rations on the floor of the chopper in front of me. So if you're near at the fire base, the chopper banked to come in to land, and the sea rations slid right out the door. <laughs> So I said, well, that goes that theory of the wind holding you in. <laughs> but, uh, I was mean. Was that your sea rations? Yeah. I mean, it was, it, was, it was, well, I guess it was sea rations for the company because it was, it was a whole, it was a whole stack of sea rations on the floor and they just went right out the door. I said, well, well, that blows that theory. And that was basically what we did. We would march and through the jungle and set up at night, fire missions and move on. And, I mean, that was what I did for my duration over there. Well, what, uh, t tell me about, uh, you know, going, going out, you went out on patrols, didn't you? Yes, we went on give patrol. Me, uh, give me and an the viewer of this, uh, DVD and an example of uh, going out on patrol was that was that daytime or nighttime? We conducted uh, daytime patrols, and uh, it was called S and D Search and Destroy. And if we found catches of rice, sometimes if we would run up on a village and we took fire from the village, of course we would go in and burn the village down. And, we often said that, well, if there weren't VC when we got here, they were VC when we left. And uh, at night, we would set up a, a perimeter. We'd dig in, and sometimes they'd bring in the 81 millimeter mortars, mortars and we would set them up in the, in the middle of the perimeter, and we would conduct ambushes from that area. And sometimes we would set, we never stayed in a place more than two days because if you stayed in along with that would give the VC a chance to set up and put booby traps around your position and also more to you and possibly attack. So you you kind of stayed mobile. You, you had to move. Did you experience any booby traps of any kind when you were walking through the jungle in the daytime? I saw a few. We all, we also lost a guy to a mine. That he he stepped on a mine, lost his leg, and uh, we lost a uh, officer to a uh, Claymore mine. This was a big disc with steel shrapnel in it, and they were, it was a directional type mine, and and he happened to be in the blast area, and it, he was killed. And another guy, like I said, stepped on a mine. He took his leg off, and it uh, also injured the uh, company commander. So there weren't an awful lot of mines, but yes, they were there. They were present. Were there were there paths that you were following, or were you mm -hmm. off uh, the paths? If you if you followed the path, you were committing suicide, because most of the paths were were booby trapped. So you usually cut a new path through the jungle because the Viet Cong would, would booby trap trails and paths and they would put up different signals so their people would know where the booby traps were and how to avoid them, whereas we had no clue. Did you ever learn how, uh, how they put those signals up, what they were what they consisted I, I, of? I, I could not interpret the signals okay. if, if they put them up, I didn't, but I was told that there were ways that they knew where not to go and where not to step, whereas we didn't. Did you ever encounter any uh, pits with uh, bungee sticks in, in them? I saw one, because one, one of the guys pointed it out, but it was an old bungee, bungee pit and the things were rotten, so it, it wasn't the first. People have to bear in mind that it takes a lot of work to set up a booby trap. 
And the VC probably didn't have the manpower to do that. If you were approaching a base camp, uh, one of the areas of operation, you would run across more booby traps and mines than just in the ordinary part of the jungle. You didn't, you didn't encounter a lot of booby traps. Did you come across any uh, caves, tunnels? Yes. We, and there was all, always a couple of small guys in the outfit that they were given a 45 and a flashlight to go in the tunnel. Fortunately, I was too big. Good. <laughs> to go in the tunnel. Uh, how, do you know how far back they would go into the tunnels? Big pardon? Do you know how far back into the tunnel mm -hmm. they would go? They wouldn't go very far. They weren't stupid. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were going on someone else's turf and you don't know where you're going, he knows where you are, and he knows where he is. So that, that wasn't a very smart move on anyone's part. Well, when you, when you came across these tunnels, did you do anything to destroy them? Or? Usually we would, we would call up the uh, engineer. We always had an a, uh, engineer with us that was an expert in explosives, and usually we would blow them. Mm -hmm. But that was always more than one, air, one opening to a tunnel, so you blow sure. one opening and have other openings. They so. might have a half a dozen more. Yes. Um, did you ever go into one after it had been secured by the military to see how extensive it was and what all they had in there? Not really, no. And I've had guys tell me that they had a real, had like, you know, they had the hospital and the eating area and the offices. I, and I have, I have heard that there were, there were t tones, like you say, that they had hospitals and stuff. But we never explored any to that extent. Well, when you uh, when you set up at night, um, what kind of precautions did you take? We would we would s dig foxholes, set claymore mines up out front. We 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 would set up trip flares where if someone were to walk in and trip a flare, it would go off and we would know where they were. And it was usually in a a circular position with the command post in the center. And our foxholes would be around, usually two men foxholes. And we'd dig in and if if the ground permitted we would dig it we would dig a hole deep enough to stand in and we and we'd sandbag ourselves for overhead cover to to try to protect us against incoming mortar rounds. Well, in the two man foxhole would one one guy be sleeping and the other guy's awake? Yes. And uh, what kind of shifts did you have? Two hours, four hours? It use use a couple of hours. Mm-hmm. Two hours on, two hours off. And uh, you did some of those shifts? Quite a few. And what weapon did you have at the time? I had, I had a, uh, a uh, M16. Right. Now you also were a mortar man. Yes. And when would you set up your mortar? We, were, we would set up our mortars at night. They were too heavy to, to carry. So usually the uh, helicopters would bring the mortars out at night and we'd set the mortars up at night, and like I said, that would depend on where we were. If, they, if, if it was in deep jungle where we could not get the rounds in there because the mortars have to have a clear area. Right, right. If, if we could not get the mortars in the air, then uh, they wouldn't bring them out. It was only when it was feasible to bring out the mortars. Well, uh, you, you had a close call the first time you landed. Uh, when you had your head down and you were warned not to do that anymore. No. Did you have any more landings uh, by helicopter where you that had was, any close calls? We, that was our main mode of uh, operations was, was helicopters. And no, I, I suppose I was lucky. I never, that was the closest call of, because you, you go into, into three phases. The first phase, when you first hit country and you're out on operations, you're scared to death and you're convinced that you're not gonna make it, but, but you're just plain scared. And then the, the second phase, you are so tired and miserable, your feet hurt, and you, you you have lost friends, and you have pretty much given up hope, and you want to get it over with. Let's just get it over with, I'm tired. And then the, 
The third phase, with about two, maybe three months ago, you start thinking, you know what, I just might make it. So then you're scared again that you won't make it. Uh -huh. But, I mean, and and I've said this a thousand times. You you know you read stories about this this guy that was skilled in this and skilled in that and experienced. My my skills and my experience had nothing to do with me getting home. I think I was just plain lucky, and by the grace of God, I made it home. Well, is it is it too upsetting to tell me uh, any instances where you were in? in combat and lost some of your friends? Yes, one one strikes me, and I, I, I do not understand the situation that we are in now, but that was a white guy from Tennessee, David Crow. We called him Whitey. And there was a black kid, I believe he was from Georgia, Monday. And Monday was out setting up claymores, and he got hit. And everybody was telling him to lay down, don't move. Well, because he was in pain, he kept rolling around and they kept shooting him. Mm. Whitey, David Crow, ran out and, and attempted to lay on him to hold him down. And Whitey was also killed. And of course, David was white, Monday was black. And over there, it made no difference, and I don't understand why we can't live by those same principles today. Mm -hmm. But that, that, I will carry that with me for the rest of my life, because, I mean, these guys were just friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't, and uh, by the way, David Crow was also a Silver Star recipient. And uh, he earned that at an operation called Five Base Burt. And I only knew two Silver Star recipients, Baxter Ellis and David Crow. Baxter Ellis was the guy that I helped put on the chopper, and David Crow was the guy that was killed trying to save his friend. Mm -hmm. Those were the only two suit, Silver Star recipients that I knew, and they're both dead. So, uh, what about the, um, the philosophy of no man left behind? Uh, how did you save the, how did you retrieve those two bodies? Uh, well, we called in artillery and airstrikes and whatever silenced the uh, the 51 caliber that was shooting at them, and we were we were able to uh, ret to uh, retrieve them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know. So uh, when you're out in at night uh, and you're protecting the perimeter. Uh, did you have any uh, incursions by the, the VC trying to get in? Yes, sometimes, but uh, there were times when we, at Fiberst Burt, they got overran. And before it was over, I think my battalion killed over 400 Viet Cong. So well, there were there were occasions of intrusions. Mm -hmm. and of course, there were also a couple of unlucky dogs. If we were near a, vigil, a village, if they got too close at night, no one's going to wait and see if you know if it's a real deal. But uh, that was some intrusion, but not not an awful lot. No, I was lucky to be stationed where we were down south compared to the guys that were up north near Pleiku and uh, Loch Nan, where they were hardcore NVA. 
our main people that we fought were VC, the local. The only time we ran into the NVA was doing TET. All right, so how could you tell the difference between the, the VC? Well, the VC were black pajamas. The NVA wore uniforms. They were, they were uniformed soldiers. Some of them were also Chinese because you could tell by the size of some of them that they were maybe Chinese instructors. Uh, I don't know what they were, but. Uh, by size, were they taller than the? Oh, the, yes, yes. That was one guy we found that was, heck, heck, he was over six feet tall. A Chinaman? Yeah. So, um, were, were you ever in a situation, and I've heard where in the daytime uh, you, you might be getting fed by or have a haircut by uh, a Vietnam person and at night they're trying to kill you? I wasn't in base camp that much, but uh, I do remember there was an artillery battery across the road from where our tents, our company area, and I do remember a a housekeeper or somebody getting caught walking off paces from the road to the artillery. Okay, because he's going to be an informant. Yes, they got caught, but I'm sure there were instances where they were not caught, but yeah. this one got caught yeah. pacing off the uh, the distance from the road to the, uh, to the uh, artillery battery. Did you... Uh, yourself and, and your company uh, or platoon go in, go into uh, villages where you knew there was a VC in there? Yes. And uh, usually, usually when we would approach, we would take fire from that area and quite often you'd go into villages there was no one there. They had all abandoned because they saw us coming, which meant they were more than likely mostly VC. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned the Tet. You were over there during the Tet Offensive. Yes. And can you tell me about your experience in the Tet? Well, I, I can remember going on, uh, we were on operations a couple of weeks before, and I remember this uh, platoon sergeant saying, what happened to all the VC? They're all gone. I said to myself, I said, well, you know what? We haven't seen any for, for, for a while. And then the, the night of Tet, we found out they were massing to attack. And were, were you in on being attacked during the Tet Offensive? Uh, we were going to go out to reinforce this company, and they called it off because we couldn't land. But the next day, we were moved to a river, we were moved to the Saigon River yeah, outside of Tonsonute Air Base because the base was getting rocket fire from the uh, river area. So we went out there and we started looking for 122 rocket sites. And I can remember we found two, two rocket sites where they were launching 122 rockets in, into Saigon and the air base. So from the, from the river? Yes from the river area. Okay. But they didn't have any floating... No, 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 okay. no, no. I, I, I do remember our first night there, we pitched tents and uh, did not realize that the tide was coming in. So sometimes that night, guys started uh, cussing and raising hell about the water. And we had to move in the middle of the night because the tide, <laughs> when the tide rose, it, it pushed the river back uh -huh. up. So, but other than that, you know, it wasn't, wasn't really a big deal. Did you ever get out of country into Laos or Cambodia? We went to Cambodia because I, I remember getting a letter from my mother saying something about she had heard that we were going to Cambodia and we were laughing and said, well, we've, we've been in Cambodia for two weeks. 
but quite often we would chase a unit over the over the uh, Cambodian border, and I think it was finally made public. But yeah, we, I I've been into Cambodia. Was was uh, where where were the planta rubber plantations? What part of the Michelin rubber? Yes, they were around. They were all around the, our area, and if you damaged a tree, you had to uh, pay for the damage to the trees. And I can remember we were moved up to Loch Nan for an operation, and right outside our base camp, that was this big villa. I think we might have a helicopter warming up out front. Let's, let's take a break a minute. Okay. Okay. So I, we were at this base camp Loch Nan, and we were dug in around the perimeter, the perimeter guard, because we were there as a as a backup force force for the Fourth Infantry. And I remember looking over the fence, and down the hill was this was this big fancy villa or house or whatever you want to call it. it had a swimming pool in the back, <laughs> tennis courts. And I remember this French girl was out in the pool, and of course, the guys were the guys were checking her out. And I, we asked somebody, <laughs> and this was the overseer of the plantation, of the rubber plantation. Uh -huh. He didn't have any guards. He was living the life. And I found out later that they were paying the VC to leave them alone. Uh. But I mean, it was, I mean, this beautiful house, tennis courts, swimming pool, I, I don't, just mind blowing. And here we are at war and we're looking over the fence at these people going about their daily lives. It's just like nothing's happening. Nothing's happening, no, it's really strange. But uh, Michelin was a, they had rubber plantations all over and you had to be careful not to mistake the, the the rubber workers for VC. And for all I know, they could have been VC at night, I don't know, but you know, they were to be, uh, I guess, respected during the day. Uh -huh. Because they were out harvesting the... the uh, harvesting the rubber. Uh -huh. That was kind of weird. So, uh, when did you get word that you were gonna be able to come home? Well, you kind of count the days because we were we were on an operation down near Kuchi, and we were going to convoy back to our base camp. And the roads weren't really safe because of the mines. So I remember, since I was a short timer. I was going to hitch a ride with the with the helicopter back to my base camp, and I'm sneaking across the airstrip, and my CO saw me. He, he said, "Hey, where you going?" So I'm catching a ride. I said, "No." So I had to drive a jeep back from uh, from uh, <laughs> Coochie back to my base camp. Where was, your, where was your base camp then? Uh, Dao Tang. It was about. Oh, I think about 50 miles away. And how long would it take you to drive that in the Jeep? All day. <laughs> because you drive, you stop, you drive, and you stop. Somebody hit a mine, they'd have to clear the mine, fill the hole in, and drive on. It was, it was an all-day process. And I didn't want to do that because I was, I was leaving in a week. Mm -hmm. But hey, you know, you do what you have to do. So you got back to base camp, and what'd you do then for that week? Just processed out, uh, went around, said my goodbyes, and exchanged addresses. You know, yeah, we're gonna write, we're gonna stay in contact, and uh, nobody did. I was able to find one of my buddies, Benford. I just typed his name in one day on the computer, and it popped up Hobbs, New Mexico, uh, deputy chair. And he was also head of the, uh, I don't know, some, some law is the Elks or something. He was head of that. 
So I called Elks Lodge and I said, uh, is uh, Benford, Clarence Benford there? He said, no, he's home. He said, may I ask who's calling? So I told him, and I bet it wasn't five minutes later Benford called me. Uh -huh. And uh, so we've been, we talked back and forth, but that's the only person I, I've been able to, to really contact since. Now, how did you know him over in Vietnam? We were, we were in the same pl platoon. Okay. I remember the uh, NCOs, we had our own hooch, myself, Benford, and Powell. We had our own hooch. And Benford and Powell went out drinking one night. And Benford come back in. I'm going to shoot that MF when he walks through the door. So I said, you're going to shoot him? I'm going to shoot Powell. So he said, get up. Help me shoot him. <laughs> so I said, no. I rolled over and went back to sleep. Benford sat in there locked and loaded. I went back to sleep. I woke up next morning. Benford's laying on the bed, sleep with his M16 across his stomach. And Powell's laying over in, in his bed asleep. Did you find out why he wanted to shoot him? I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I know it didn't upset me enough to stay up to, to watch. I went to sleep. So and, and the next day they were all fine. So I, I suppose they didn't. Now, you mentioned the word hooch. Uh, somebody that's watching this doesn't know what you're talking about. What's a hooch look like? A hooch, we had a single, it's probably 12 by 12, enough room for maybe three or four bunks in our personal items. It was a, a t frame of two by fours with screen wire around the top and a tent thrown over the top of the framework. And that's what we call a hooch. Okay, do you have any sandbags around it? We had sandbags up around, up probably about halfway the wall. Okay. And of course, if a rocket come down to the top, it's... No help at all? No, no, no. What, no you, help at all. Did you ever have nighttime rocket attacks when you were... Yes, running? we had quite a few. Matter of fact, I lost my real, real, I had a, I had a prize real to reel recorder, and I would write the radio station. As a matter of fact, there was a station in Memphis, Tennessee. I wrote and asked for tapes, and they'd send us tapes. And a rocket came in one night, and we were in the bunk and destroyed my, my reel to reel. But so where'd the rocket hit? Inside the tent. Inside? Yeah, but we weren't in. We were in a bunk. Uh, uh. We, get, we got a warning, and we. Well, when they first started coming in, we ran to the bunker. Okay, what did the bunker look like? It, it was a sandbagged area, probably six feet deep. Sandbags on the, up the sides, about three feet, and about three layers of sandbags on the top, covered by beams, they had wooden beams. Okay. Cut. And you'd go in and go under. So after the rocket attack, you go back to your hooch. Go back to your hooch. And then, <laughs> what did you see when you went back? No, I was upset, but hey, I was alive, so yeah. so, so it didn't matter. I I remember, we had this little kid from Alabama. He got hit by a rock by a rocket attack, and he spent some time in Japan recuperating. And when they sent him back. We were standing outside the hooches one day, and this F-4 Phantom flew over real slow, and it was like a screaming noise, you know, circling the base camp. We all knew it was a jet. We all even knew what type it was. But this little kid from Alabama was so gun shy, when he heard that jet, he took off to run into the bunker. And of course, we all followed him. We knew why he was running. We knew what he was running from. But we still, just in case, we went to the bunker with him. Mm -hmm. And of course, all clear we came out. But such as it was. Well, now, you knew, you knew what the noise was. Yes, I knew what it was. We all knew what it was, well, except. Did, did you go to the bunker to kind of support him? 
Well, I think we went to the bunker just in case we were wrong. <laughs> 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 maybe we thought maybe you know he heard something we didn't. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> could you could you tell what kind of ordinance was coming in by the sound of it? Well, the rock is kind of screened. The mortars, you would hear them go off, a little bloop out in the jungle, and that's you the didn't noise coming out of the tube. Yeah, but you didn't really hear them after that. The we, that was a theory, if you heard it, you were okay. It was the ones mm -hmm. that you didn't hear mm -hmm. were the ones that would get you. Mm -hmm. So uh, once, you, once you hear them go off, you had no idea. Until they started hitting the ground. Once they started hitting the ground, it could have been the other side of the base camp. So you weren't really concerned about that. So um, uh, did, did you have occasion to uh, use your own mortar? Oh, yes. On the, uh, now, what size was it? 81 millimeter. And how big were those shells? It's about like that. About that big around, how long, about that long, mm -hmm. all right. And uh, how many men were in the mortar squad? That was a three-man crew that shot the gun. Okay, tell me what each one that did. That was a loader, a one that set the sights, and there was another guy that prepared the ammo. All right. There was one guy that stood up and dropped around. There was another guy that was kneeling beside it. He was the one that set the Dialing sights. Dialing in the range. Yeah, and the other guy fixed the charges. There was a bunch of charges around the bottom of the mortar. Okay. And depending on how far you wanted to shoot, you, he would pull off or add charges oh, okay. to get the distance you needed. All right. Now, to be a mortar man, did you have to pass any kind of an accuracy test? I, I did when we were in uh, training. In training. And what level accuracy did you have? I, I don't remember what we, I think, I think I qualify an expert. We usually, okay. you know. That's a, I was wondering if it was kind of similar to yeah, yeah, shooting similar a to, rifle. Yes, or, yes, yes, I believe it was. Okay. <clears throat> now we've got a picture of you here. Let's give him time to focus in on it. Got it? Yeah. Now, I suppose that's you. That's me. And what are you carrying? That's a 12 gauge Stevens shotgun. We, we use those on ambush. Oh really? It was loaded with buckshot. All right. And uh, where, where is that? This was in Dao Tang. This was our hooch. You, you see the, the wooden framework, the tent up top, and the screen? Uh-huh. That was screened to, to supposedly keep the uh, mosquitoes out. But usually they just opened the door and walked in. <laughs> was, was, was a hooch out in the field, or was that at base camp? That was in base camp. Um. Now, tell me about uh, the shotgun and ambushes. When, when would you go out on ambushes? At night. We would use a set <clears throat> we used to set up ambushes at night along a known trail, a uh, known area that we thought they would travel was when we set up ambush. And usually maybe 10, 12 guys. Were you involved in those? Yes. And were any of those successful in getting any of the VC? Well, or? No, the normal procedure of an ambush, if someone comes down the trail, it, sometimes if it's too many of them, you let them go. But if it was maybe three or four, you'd open up on them and you'd, you'd leave the area because you didn't know who was coming behind them. Okay. So usually you would, you would trip the ambush, you would, you would fire your claymores, shoot whatever ammo you had and, and, and get the heck Skedaddle, out of it. Skedaddle, huh? Yes. You didn't stand around with a flashlight checking them out. <laughs> you weren't you weren't counting bodies. That's no, for sure. no, no. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what what kind of uh, recognitions did you have? What kind of medals did you get for your service? Over I Vietnam? I didn't really get any medals other than the CIB Combat Infantry Badge. That shows that you have 
I believe, served 30 days in combat. And the rest of them were, were our unit citations. Well, you have the National Defense Service Medal. I think everybody got that. Vietnam Campaign Medal with Bronze Service Star. Anybody that was there, I believe, got those. And you had a Vietnam Campaign Medal with Device, 1960. Yeah. I don't know, just Every, a medal. <laughs> everybody not one of those? Yeah, I believe there? so. And then the Combat Infantryman Badge, that's a period of time over there. And, yeah, th in that was the guys that was, in the, that was in the infantry and that spent time on, on the fire, yes. Who was your uh, commander or captain or uh, most of the time you were there? Or did you have several? We had several. Uh, did you have anyone that you particularly liked? That was one. What was his name? God, I can't remember his name now. <laughs> but that was one that pretty much looked out, out, looked out mm -hmm. for us. And uh, matter of fact, he wrote a book afterwards and uh, but he was a guy that would come to your defense he made sure that you got what you needed mm -hmm. in, other, in other words you knew that you were that he cared now when you were when you were out on ambush were you just there over overnight or just for a few hours you would usually leave out at just as the sun was going down and you would set up in one area. When it got dark, or darker, you would move to your primary location. And there you would set until almost dawn, and then you would pack up and leave. How about uh, when, when you're in camp, what kind of meals did you have? Uh, we had the traditional sea rations. Uh, were those left over from Korea or World War II? Probably World War One. Yeah, they were left over from, uh, I'm sure the Korean War, possibly World War II, I don't know, but I mean, they, on the, the best thing in there were beans and weenies, peaches and pound cake. The ham and lima beans were terrible. The eggs were terrible. But you always had a bottle of hot sauce. You like hot sauce? Well, I mean, it killed it killed the taste. <laughs> and and uh, cigarettes? Did uh, it contain? You, uh, you got cigarettes <clears throat> in your sea rations, but I didn't smoke, so it wasn't a big deal to me. But yeah, I just used to give them somebody else. How about alcohol? Was there alcohol in the camp? Uh, in the evenings, you would usually get, if possible, they would bring out a can of pop and a can of beer. What kind of beer was it? Different varieties? Different different varieties. It wasn't the primo kind, I can tell you that. <laughs> but I would use to trade my beer to someone. For pop? For pop, yeah. Good. So um, how much do you weigh now? Uh, about 200. And how much did you weigh when you were over in Vietnam? About 175. I remember coming home, my mother didn't know me. Because you were so thin? Yeah, I was thin. What did yeah. you weigh when you went over? Probably about 190, 100, somewhere in there. Uh -huh. <coughs> uh, tell me again where you left from to come home? I left, uh, well, actually, I left Dao Ting. I went to Ben, to Benoit. And then we uh, flew out of Benoit. Matter of fact, we flew out back on Flying Tiger Airlines, and we had flight attendants with miniskirts on. <laughs> All right. Flying and Tiger was that? That was commercial then. Commercial, yes. And where we, did you? We flew back into Travis Air Base. Straight, straight shot. Or did you have to stop in? We Hawaii stopped or in uh, Guam Japan. Or we stopped in Japan. Yeah, we stopped in Japan. Spend any time there, or just no, refuel? No, no, just refuel. And then you came back to where, Travis? Travis Air Base, and I took uh, flights. I don't know, several flights 
to get me back home. I remember I caught the bus to Vaden, Mississippi, got off the bus, walked up the street. My mother was working in, uh, I think she's working for the county. And I walked in and saw her and found someone to take me to the house. And my mother had, they had built a new house. And I remember going in through the carport and there was another door, so I opened the door and I'm in the backyard. So I reversed course, went back in the laundry room and I found another door that <laughs> got me in the house. Did your mother know you were coming? She knew I was on my way. She didn't know exactly <laughs> what, when I was coming. What she What she do when she saw you there? She 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 jumped up and hugged me. Matter of fact, every every, every everybody in town would come to to see me. And uh, I went out to the farm the next week to help my uncle, <coughs> and he was getting in hay. And uh, I remember was doing something to the old truck. I was laying under the truck, and this white farmer, Mr. Campbell, he was uh, one of the wealthy farmers in the area, and sometimes as a kid I worked for him, driving tractor or whatever. But anyway, he stopped by to talk to my uncle, and he saw that he said, whose feet? My uncle said, that's Paul. So he reached down and grabbed me by my feet, pulled me from under the truck, and uh, I stood up and I reached out to shake his hand. He said, I don't want to shake your hand. He says, I want to hug. So he says, good to have you back. <laughs> so so uh, what did you do from that point? I. Uh, Went to uh, Fort Carson, Colorado. From there, we went to the Great Lakes Naval Station after they trained us for riot control and for the Democratic Convention in 1968. And I said to myself, I've got to get out of here. So I discovered that if you would take a teaching position, they would let you out early. So I inquired some friends in Columbus and I found out there was an opening in Springfield. So the assistant principal of Springfield flew out to Fort Carson, interviewed me, and he was, a, by the way, a retired captain in the Army. Came to Springfield and uh, took up a teaching position. What were you teaching? Industrial Arts. Okay. And uh, Did they have a nice facility? Yes. Got married. Well, now tell me about this. Where did you meet her? When I was teaching, when I was taking uh, courses for the teaching position, I met her at a junior college where I was doing my student teaching. And we exchanged letters back and forth while I was in service. And okay. so when I came back, we got married. And she moved to Springfield with me. We had a child. And we were married for about 10 years. Things didn't work out. So anyway, got divorced. And in the meantime, I quit teaching and started working for a parts store in Springfield. I was making more money. I worked there for 20 years. What was the name of that auto parts? Springfield store? Tire and Battery. Okay. And uh, what did you do for them? I was a salesman. I sold shop equipment, auto parts. I would call on different garages if they needed a lift or air compressor. Just a, just a basic salesman. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I taught there for, I mean, I worked there for 20 years. And I, I remarried. My wife was an, Charlene was an x ray technician at uh, Mercy Medical. She had two girls and I had one and they were starting to college and she said, honey, you need to get a better job. So I applied for Honda manufacturing in Marysville and I was hired there. I worked in material service. I became a production coordinator. I had about 50 people working for me 
And I worked there until uh, 2009, I retired. Third. And my wife was having some health problems. She had a couple of heart surgeries. Oh. And I took care of her until 2014, she passed. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, after she passed, I restored a 66 Mustang and I built a 32 Ford. So. Uh, you built a 32 Ford? Yes. Tell me about building. Well, before I get into that, what was your first wife's name? Amelia. Amelia? Mm -hmm. What was her maiden name? Roland. R-O-W-L-A-N-D. R-O-L-A-N-D. Okay. And your, your second wife was? Shirling. Uh, spell that for me. S-H-E-R-L-E-N-E. -E. Okay. What was her? Her, her maiden name was Womack, W-O-M-A-C-K. Right. Uh, so, she had a heart, heart attack? That was she had, she had, I remember she went in for a, a heart cap. Okay. And my daughter and I dropped off and we went back and it told us that uh, we would have to do surgery the next, they did surgery on her the next, they did open heart surgery on her the next day. They put in a, a uh, bypass. So that worked for about four years. She started getting sick again. So then she went to Ohio State and they put in a pig valve. Okay. And after that, she lived for another four years. And Good. they the heart wants to stay wet and the kidneys wants to stay dry. And the combination of trying to balance, find a happy medium for the two of them finally caught up with them. Oh. And she passed away. All right. Now, and she had she had two children. She had two children. What Nicole. Were their names? Nicole oh. and okay. and Shannon. All right. So while I was taking care of her, I found this Mustang, '66 Mustang, and I would take my wife out, sit her in the sunroom, and that way I could see her from the shop. I had a a shop built, which is kind of a funny story how that happened because she was in the kitchen ironing and I started up the lawnmower in the garage and the back door was open and she said, I wish you wouldn't do that. I said, do what? Start the lawnmower up in the garage. I said, well, I suppose I could push it out. No, I don't want you doing that. So. I said, so what do you want me to do? I don't know. I said, so how about if I built a, another building? She said, built another building? I said, yeah, put the lawnmower in. So she said, she said, tell you what, said, I'll give you $5,000, but you come up with the rest of the money, I don't care. So anyway, I built myself a two-car garage out beside the other. And uh, so when, I retired and I started taking care of her. I bought this 66 Mustang and I stripped it completely to a bare shell and uh, I rebuilt it and I gave it to my granddaughter. Oh wow. And she's only 12 so it's still at the house. And uh, after that I got, Dick, hey. after, after I got that I uh, Built a 32 Ford from scratch. I, I bought a frame, bought a body, rebuilt an engine, transmission from scratch. All by yourself? All by myself. So it's now running. So I got two, I got, so. So what's your granddaughter's name that? Uh, Dominique. Dominique? Mm -hmm. She's so, 12 and she's got a 66. Mustang. Mustang. And the, the hell, I don't want her driving it. I, I told her mother, Nicole, I said, when she is ready for college, I said, you take the car and sell it. Should be worth pretty good money by that oh, time. Oh, yeah. So what anyway, color is it? Blue. What's the interior? It's black. What color is your Ford? It's black cherry. Okay. Inside? With a tan interior. And it's, it's got air conditioning, power brakes, power steam, fuel injection. It's got a computer just like your car. <laughs> do, you, do you drive it in parades or anything? 
No, I just go to car shows. Uh, I might drive it in the Memorial Day Parade in Springfield this this year. I don't know. Okay. But uh, and then I come up here, of course. It gives me something to do. So what do you do now? When you say up here, you're talking about the museum here. Yeah, the museum. Dick and I were 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 a team for years. We worked together, and then he decided to move on to better things. So uh, I'm working with some other guys now. So when you say you're working here, you're helping to build this B-17. Yes. And you guys are building this from scratch. Yes. And yeah. when my granddaughter comes to visit, I bring her up and put her to work. Well, I've been here a number of times, and I think it's amazing what you guys are doing. Yeah. And uh, you have all the plans and specifications and everything. Blueprints, yes, we got it all. Yeah. Well, let me see if the, uh, Jim, do you have any questions you'd like to ask him? There was a lot of uh, unrest about us going to Vietnam. Uh, did you get any negative uh, action from people when you came back from home? No, because I came back to a small town. And uh, I think the most shocking thing I saw was when I came back to town, I drove by the the high school and it was desegregated. And I remember the, the couple of days after I was home, my mother said, I'm going to take you down and get you registered to vote. Because when I went to Vietnam, I couldn't vote. But no, that wasn't. I, I got welcomed, I believe, by, by uh, open arms from both, because in a small town, everyone knows everybody. And uh, so, no, there, there weren't any, you know, protests. Like I said, because I, I remember when I was a kid, I went in to get my driver's license, and the, the highway patrolman didn't ask me very many questions because he knew everything. I think the only thing he possibly did know was my birth date but everything else he already knew. So that kind of town in your friends, you, you don't treat friends that way. When people have gone out and put their lives on the line, in a small town, they didn't, they didn't treat you that way. Good. So no, I, I, didn't, I didn't receive any at all. How big was Viridian at the time? <laughs> A Couple thousand or less? I'd say maybe five or six hundred in the town. This was Vaden. Five or six hundred in the town. But see, there were a lot of small farms. You'd have a farmer with a hundred acres, two hundred acres. There weren't there were a few large farmers, but most people were small farms and everybody would come to town on the weekend. You'd see people rolling in town on Saturdays during the week. You'd see how, loads of beans and cotton coming into town. And uh it, it was a small, close-knit town, I think. Even, even during the segregated period, I would say people stuck together. And uh, I go back now to visit, and uh, just about the, everybody I knew was gone. I do remember I went in the grocery store, and this young man, white guy, was talking to me. He said, Paul, he said, this little place is falling apart. He said, the interstate took away the traffic, Interstate 55, because Highway 51 used to right, go right through the center of town, and there was a railroad, Eleanor Central. I don't know if you heard the uh, song Willie Nelson. There's a train they call the city of New Orleans. Yeah. The city of New Orleans went right through my town. And he said, all these things have moved, and he said, this little town's dying. That happens to little towns. Yes, yes, it happens to little towns. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, I go, I go home and look around, and that's about it. It's kind of sad, isn't it? It is. It's sad. Yeah. And then uh, even some of the towns are a little bit bigger than that. Some mall comes in and just sucks the life out of the downtown just area. Suck, Walmart, Walmart sucks the life out of towns. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, was well, there anything that I haven't asked you about that you think might be interesting to somebody that's uh, going to be listening to you or watching you well, just down the road? 
I look at the situation, and Dick and I have talked about it. I look at the situation that this country is in now. It is divided. And I would like to see us come full circle and go back to where we were before. I mean, we cannot survive the way we're going now. We will not survive the way we're going now. I just, I just, it, I look at little kids and it scares me the way we're going. So that's about all I have to say. Okay. And Dick, you're talking about Dick Bidback? He's, yes. Uh, he's going to be interviewed shortly. Yes. yes. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for your service. Thank you. And sir. Thank you for this interview. Thank you. Thank you for talking to me.